Chapter 37 By these temptations we are daily tried, O Lord. We are tried unceasingly. Our daily furnace is the human tongue, and also in this respect thou commandest us to be continent. Give what thou commandest and command what thou wilt. In this matter thou knowest the groans of my heart and the rivers of my eyes. For I am not able to know for certain how far I am clean of this plague, and I stand in great fear of my secret faults, which thy eyes perceive, though mine do not. For in respect of the pleasures of my flesh and of idle curiosity, I see how far I have been able to hold my mind in check when I abstain from them either by voluntary act of will, or because they simply are not at hand. For then I can inquire of myself how much more or less frustrating it is to me not to have them. This is also true about riches, which are sought for in order that they may minister to one of these three lusts, or two, or the whole complex of them. The mind is able to see clearly if, when it has them, it despises them so they may be cast aside and it may prove itself. But if we desire to test our power of doing without praise, must we then live wickedly or lead a life so atrocious and abandoned that every one who knows us will detest us? What greater madness than this can either be said or conceived? And yet if praise, both by custom and right, is the companion of a good life and of good works, we should as little forego its companionship as the good life itself. But unless a thing is absent, I do not know whether I should be contented or troubled at having to do without it. What is it then that I am confessing to thee, O Lord, concerning this sort of temptation? What else than that I am delighted with praise, but more with the truth itself than with praise? For if I were to have any choice whether, if I were mad or utterly in the wrong, I would prefer to be praised by all men, or, if I were steadily and fully confident in the truth, would prefer to be blamed by all, I see which I should choose. Yet I wish I were unwilling that the approval of others should add anything to my joy for any good I have. Yet I admit that it does increase it, and, more than that, dispraise diminishes it. Then, when I am disturbed over this wretchedness of mine, an excuse presents itself to me, the value of which thou knowest, O God, for it renders me uncertain. For since it is not only continence that thou hast enjoined on us, that is, what things to hold back our love from, but righteousness as well, that is, what to bestow our love upon. And hast wished us to love not only thee, but also our neighbor. It often turns out that when I am gratified by intelligent praise, I seem to myself to be gratified by the competence or insight of my neighbor. Or, on the other hand, I am sorry for the defect in him when I hear him dispraise either what he does not understand, or what is good. For I am sometimes grieved at the praise I get, either when those things that displease me in myself are praised in me, or when lesser and trifling goods are valued more highly than they should be. But again, how do I know whether I feel this way because I am unwilling that he who praises me should differ from me concerning myself, not because I am moved with any consideration for him, but because the good things that please me in myself are more pleasing to me when they also please another? For in a way, I am not praised when my judgment of myself is not praised, since either those things which are displeasing to me are praised, or those things which are less pleasing to me are more praised. Am I not then quite uncertain of myself in this respect? Behold, O truth, it is in thee that I see that I ought not to be moved by my own praises for my own sake, but for the sake of my neighbor's good. And whether this is actually my way, I truly do not know. On this score I know less of myself than thou dost. I beseech thee now, O my God, to reveal myself to me also, that I may confess to my brethren, who are to pray for me in those matters where I find myself weak. Let me once again examine myself the more diligently. If, in my own praise, I am moved with concern for my neighbor, why am I less moved if some other man is unjustly dispraised than when it happens to me? Why am I more irritated at that reproach which is cast on me than at one which is, with equal injustice, cast upon another in my presence? Am I ignorant of this also? Or is it true that I am deceiving myself, and do not keep the truth before thee in my heart and tongue. Put such madness far from me, O Lord, lest my mouth be to me the oil of sinners to anoint my head. Chapter 38 I am needy and poor. 
Still, I am better when in secret groanings I displease myself and seek thy mercy, until what is lacking in me is renewed and made complete for that peace which the eye of the proud does not know. The reports that come from the mouth and from actions known to men have in them a most perilous temptation to the love of praise. This love builds up a certain complacency in one's own excellency, and then goes around collecting solicited compliments. It tempts me, even when I inwardly reprove myself for it, and this precisely because it is reproved. For a man may often glory vainly in the very scorn of vainglory, and in this case it is not any longer the scorn of vainglory in which he glories, for he does not truly despise it when he inwardly glories it. Chapter 39 Within us there is yet another evil arising from the same sort of temptation. By it they become empty who please themselves in themselves, although they do not please or displease or aim at pleasing others. But in pleasing themselves they displease thee very much, not merely taking pleasure in things that are not good as if they were good, but taking pleasure in thy good things as if they were their own, or even as if they were thine, but still as if they had received them through their own merit, or even as if they had them through thy grace, still without this grace with their friends, but as if they envied that grace to others. In all these and similar perils and labors, thou perceivest the agitation of my heart, and I would rather feel my wounds being cured by thee than not inflicted by me on myself. Chapter 40 Where hast thou not accompanied me, O truth, teaching me both what to avoid and what to desire, when I have submitted to thee what I could understand about matters here below, and have sought thy counsel about them? With my external senses I have viewed the world as I was able, and have noticed the life which my body derives from me, and from these senses of mine. From that stage I advanced inwardly into the recesses of my memory, the manifold chambers of my mind, marvelously full of unmeasured wealth. And I reflected on this and was afraid, and could understand none of these things without thee, and found thee to be none of them. Nor did I myself discover these things, I who went over them all, and labored to distinguish and to value everything according to its dignity excepting some things upon the report of my senses and questioning about others which i thought to be related to my inner self distinguishing and numbering the reporters themselves and in that vast storehouse of my memory investigating some things depositing other things taking out still others neither was i myself when i did this that is that ability of mind by which i did it nor was it thou for thou art that never failing light from which i took counsel about all them whether they were what they were, and what was their real value. In all this I heard thee teaching and commanding me, and this I often do, and this is a delight to me, and as far as I can get relief from my necessary duties, I resort to this kind of pleasure. But in all these things which I review when I consult thee, I still do not find a secure place for my soul save in thee, in whom my scattered members may be gathered together and nothing of me escape from thee. And sometimes thou introducest me to a most rare and inward feeling, an inexplicable sweetness. If this were to come to perfection in me, I do not know to what point life might not then arrive. But still, by these wretched weights of mine, I relapse into these common things, and am sucked in by my old customs, and am held. I sorrow much, yet I am still closely held. To this extent, then, the burden of habit presses us down. I can exist in this fashion, but I do not wish to do so. In that other way I wish I were, but cannot be. In both ways I am wretched. Chapter 41 And now I have thus considered the infirmities of my sins, under the headings of the three major lusts, and I have called thy right hand to my aid. For with a wounded heart I have seen thy brightness, and having been beaten back I cried, Who can attain to it? I am cut off from before thy eyes. Thou art the truth, who presidest over all things, but I, because of my greed, did not wish to lose thee. But still, along with thee, I wish also to possess a lie, just as no one wishes to lie in such a way as to be ignorant of what is true. By this I lost thee, for thou wilt not condescend to be enjoyed along with a lie. Chapter 42 whom could I find to reconcile me to thee? Should I have approached the angels? What kind of prayer? What kind of rites? 
Many who were striving to return to thee, and were not able of themselves have, I am told, tried this, and have fallen into a longing for curious visions, and deserved to be deceived. Being exalted, they sought thee in their pride of learning, and they thrust themselves forward rather than beating their breasts. And so, by a likeness of heart, they drew to themselves the princes of the air, their conspirators and companions in pride, by whom they were deceived by the power of magic. Thus they sought a mediator by whom they might be cleansed, but there was none. For the mediator they sought was the devil, disguising himself as an angel of light. And he allured their proud flesh the more because he had no fleshly body. They were mortal and sinful, but thou, O Lord, to whom they arrogantly sought to be reconciled, art immortal and sinless. But a mediator between God and man ought to have something in him like God and something in him like man, lest in being like man he should be far from God, or if only like God he should be far from man, and so should not be a mediator. That deceitful mediator then, by whom, by thy secret judgment, human pride deserves to be deceived, had one thing in common with man, that is, his sin. In another respect, he would seem to have something in common with God. For not being clothed with the mortality of the flesh, he could boast that he was immortal. But since the wages of sin is death, what he really has in common with men is that, together with them, he is condemned to death. Chapter 43 But the true mediator, whom thou in thy secret mercy hast revealed to the humble, and hast sent to them, so that through his example they also might learn the same humility, that mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, appeared between mortal sinners and the immortal just one. He was mortal as men are mortal, he was righteous as God is righteous, and because the reward of his righteousness is life and peace, he could, through his righteousness united with God, cancel the death of justified sinners, which he was willing to have in common with them. Hence he was manifested to holy men of old, to the end that they might be saved through faith in his passion to come, even as we through faith in his passion which is past. As man he was mediator, but as the word he was not something in between the two, because he was equal to God, and God with God, and with the Holy Spirit, one God. How hast thou loved us, O good Father, who dost not spare thy only Son, but didst deliver him up for us wicked ones? How hast thou loved us, for whom he did not count it robbery to be equal with thee, became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross? He alone was free among the dead. He alone had power to lay down his life and power to take it up again. And for us he became to thee both victor and victim, and victor because he was the victim. For us, he was to thee both priest and sacrifice, and priest because he was the sacrifice. Out of slaves, he maketh us thy sons, because he was born of thee and did serve us. Rightly, then, is my hope fixed strongly on him, that thou wilt heal all my diseases through him, who sitteth at thy right hand, and maketh intercession for us. Otherwise I should utterly despair, for my infirmities are many and great, Indeed, they are very many and very great, but thy medicine is still greater. Otherwise, we might think that thy word was removed from union with man, and despair of ourselves, if it had not been that he was made flesh and dwelt among us. Terrified by my sins and the load of my misery, I had resolved in my heart and considered flight into the wilderness. But thou didst forbid me, and thou didst strengthen me, saying that, since Christ died for all, they who live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him who died for them. Behold, O Lord, I cast all my care on thee, that I may live and behold wondrous things out of thy law. Thou knowest my incompetence and my infirmities. Teach me and heal me. Thy only Son, he in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge, hath redeemed me with his blood. Let not the proud speak evil of me, because I keep my ransom before my mind, and eat and drink and share my food and drink. For, being poor, I desire to be satisfied from him, together with those who eat and are satisfied, and they shall praise the Lord that seek him. End of Book 10, Chapters 34-43